Hi guys. Let's just do some part time permies. Mike is turning off our sprinkler, so we'll be joining us. I think he's coming in right now. So, um, welcome, welcome to everybody here. Um, I was just on, actually, I think Breakaway Homesteader, weren't you just on the, uh, on the road show? Um, or not. I'm trying to remember. Um, can't have sprinklers on during a live feed. <laughs> Actually, there's a fast moving storm coming in. It's getting cool and very dark and thundering. Oh, we might get natural water. I don't know if it's going to hit us. I think it may blow yeah. right over. It's we'll have to really see. Fast. We'll have to see. Um, so anyway, guys, we are just starting out. It looks like we have a bit of a delay because, uh, yeah, we do have a little bit of a delay here tonight. So excuse me if it takes a minute to answer your texts or your chats. If we get a really big storm, we might get a momentary loss of internet. Usually it does all right. Yeah, we're usually okay here. I'm hoping that won't affect us. Um, but if this blows in, um, it's just a little front. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. But looks like we have a good number of people in here. Um, let's see. It's about seven people watching so far. And MT, hello, Breakaway Homesitter, Island Homesitter. You were Island Homesitter was over in the roads. So, Carrie. Um, Carrie, hello. Re regular, yep. Yeah. It snowed in Texas, really? Wait, what? Oh, like it snowed. <laughs> I was like, wait, you're Looks complaining like... about how hot and dry it was for the last <laughs> month. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, geese started molting. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, the geese have some nice, nice, soft, downy feathers. You wonder why they make blankets and pillows out of those down, that goose down. Um, I actually caught Lucky today for the first time in a while. Um, he doesn't usually let me pick him up, but he's been limping around a little bit, uh, favoring his right foot a little bit, and I just wanted to take a look at that. So when I brought the treats over tonight, I actually picked him up because he came in close with all the chickens and got him before he ran away. Um, take a look at his foot and don't see anything wrong with it. Um, I was trying to feel if it was, you know, more hotter than the other foot, but geese are actually hot in general, <laughs> like chickens, they're just hot. So it was hard to tell if there was any, um, any difference actually there. So I think he just stubbed his toe. Stubbed his toe. He's been limping a little bit for about three days. Two I want to say days, two yeah. or three days. Um, he's not nub of a, a toe that sticks out the back and he likes to perch on the edge of his pool with his little toe on the back and the web feet curled over, kind of like he's trying to be a chicken or something. And I'm wondering if he t sprained that toe at all. So that's my guess is he twisted or sprained something yeah. temporarily. Anyway, so he seems okay. Otherwise, he's drinking, he's eating, he's hobbling around. He's me. I'm not letting him into the coop at night, or he hasn't gone up the ramp into the coop that I've seen at all. So again, that might hurt his foot. So he's been sleeping outside, which is fine. Gus does that every night. Yeah, anyway. we have two kitty pools, one for each of the geese. Yeah. Um, the chickens occasionally take a little water out, but it's kind of high for them. They're not too interested in it. They can reach in yeah, for drinks, but can. it gets dirty they so fast. They don't, yeah, they, they don't swim in it. No. And <laughs> we keep it away from the really young ones in case they fall in and try drown. to, although we have a bunch of young ones with Gus right now and they seem to be doing okay. I hope we don't have any issues. They're pretty not good I flyers. That. I think they might almost freak out and fly Except away. Except the littlest, it. um, the silkies oh, are only two weeks oh, old. Oh, that's right. They're there. So they're in that group too, but I have not even seen them try to jump up there, but they're getting more and more active. So we might have to 90 in North Carolina. Watch we that. hit in the mid, mid to 90s. upper nineties yesterday and the humidity was horrible, horrible like 90% humidity all day. We started out with a uh, fog and a bright pink sun and 75 degrees and yeah. it burned off the fog early in the morning. I just got more humid from there. Yeah. So, um, I'm sorry, multitasking here, but I was I was not actually at the market with you because I had so much paperwork for work to do that I ended up helping set up and going to work and then coming back to help break down at the market this weekend. But oh man, that was yeah. We packed up about terrible. an hour early because there were people packing up two hours early and leaving. By the time we packed up, there wasn't much left going on, and we yeah. stayed to the end. But decided and we might as well move on. I don't think I said hi to Lois Ann. Hello, Lois Ann. Thanks for joining us. And that 1870s homestead. Oh, I was, yeah, I was wondering where the Highland Homesteader. Yeah. And anybody else who we're not 
regularly speaking yeah. with where they may be. What states are you guys in? Um, I know where a lot of our regulars are from. Oh, two um, people from North Carolina. Oh, yeah. That's why they're asking where. Central, Moore County. Oh, and 1870s Hattacos. is in. Oh. We <laughs> saw them cutting cherries two at a time. Yeah, that was cool. I think, was that on Instagram? I think it was Instagram. I think it was Instagram. Today. So I saw it the other day. Yesterday, I'm so. thinking we have a cherry, a commercial cherry farm, a family run farm a mile down the road, mile and a half down the road. Yeah, thinking about doing our cherry purchase. I didn't get the chance to make the cherry jam last year, so we're almost out. Yeah, so um, oh, cherries, just the two of us, and so. then um, sweet cherries will be a while. By the way, I was doing looking at cherries Hi, Heather. in and Jan. Michigan produces almost half of the cherries for the entire country. Wow, oh, I'm sorry, wrong blueberries, blueberries. Okay, well, I'm yes. thinking of blueberries, which have just started also. About half of the blueberries in the country come from Michigan. Um, it actually is nearly double New Jersey. Huh. Uh, as much uh, what as, about Maine? I mean, Maine has all the Maine does little. the wild little ones. But yeah, Michigan uh, way, way out produces everybody else. Yeah. And most of it's right in our area. Yeah. So Heather Evans. So Heather just came over from the Justin Rhodes yeah. webinar. Um, yeah, for those of you guys on the um, premium membership at Abundant Permaculture, they do that two Sundays a month, first and third Sundays. So we are always rushing over here from that. And Justin's shouted out for us uh, these last couple of times. I have awesome. cherry, you know, speaking of cherry pie filling, <laughs> I have cherries. We like to make them in, in very light syrup, so they're yeah. not overly sweet. I packed some two years ago, just like six quarts or something, or eight quarts. It was eight yeah. quarts. Gave my mom a couple of them. I still have them. I haven't used them. I need to make a cherry pie. Yeah, um, we should have done that for my dad's birthday. They're there for two years. Well, I'm a little busy. So I know you're busy. Pies, but yeah, I have to make some pies with those. Um, but yeah, cherries. So blueberries are in for us. Cherries are in. We are the number one tart cherry producer in the country. I didn't also, know that either. yeah, we have a lot of tart fruit cherry or sweet cherry. Maybe it's sweet cherry. Maybe have, it's sweet cherry. We are the number one producer. We have a lot of fruit in our area, especially the west side of the state here, um, which they often call the fruit belt of Michigan. It's, it's used definitely. to be the biggest asparagus uh, seller, although most of that's been, it's still one of the top in the country. It's just been uh, replaced by a lot of international asparagus through the year. So. so I'm going to do just a quick little recap. We did get two videos out this week. So one of them was a chick update and nobody has guessed how many chicks we have under two months old yet. I did post that question in the discussion. I've had a couple guesses, but they were both low. So you guys can try that and see if you can figure out how many chicks we have um, by watching that video. I don't even know. I gotta. I guess I could get close, but I'm not sure I have an exact number. <laughs> I know how many there are because I know how many each mom uh, Yeah, I know out. how many of the oldest ones. I know how many silkies. Yeah, that's easy. And the other two, I could get close, but I'm not yeah. exactly I'm certain. not going to have him guess because he'll guess close and then you guys will guess on. Um, Breakaway Home Center says six. No, way low. We have four. Four broody moms hatched yeah. out chicks. We have um, four sets of chicks right now. Exactly. Uh, two months and under. So there are some bigger chicks in there. but Big Bear um, is here. Hello, Big Bear. Um, and Terry, I'm not sure if I said hi to you as well. I think you just came in. Wow, we're getting a lot of people in here and tonight. Thanks for Brin, joining. What was that Bryn say? I can see that. Um, up further? No. Bryn, Brinzy? Oh, Brinzy. Brinzy. Brin. Is it like yes. Lindsay Brinzy? That makes sense. <laughs> I'm guessing there. I hope I pronounce it right. Um, so welcome, welcome to everybody. Someone just 24. guessed 24 chicks. Um, let me think. Hold on. Almost. Not quite. You're getting closer. Um, so how long do hens brood? Yes. A big bear answered that 21 days until chickens hatch. Our geese took 28 days. We have some videos on trying to hatch goose eggs under our hens last year along with chicken eggs. So you kind of have to give the hens the chicken eggs at the right time after to be able to egg. after the goose egg so i actually had the goose eggs all under one hen until two more went broody about a week later and gave everybody each one goose egg and a couple so you got guesses of 28 yeah. and 36. 20 there's 36 is too high 28 is very close we're getting there very very close 29 not quite um 
So <laughs> we're, we're actually getting a little high now, but very close. Hi, Lois Ann again. Uh, sorry, I have to go. Okay, have a good night. Thanks for stopping in real quick. So you guys can keep guessing if you like, but... Uh, you've had a broody hen for two months. <laughs> they will stay broody yeah. um, until... They will stay broody if they have eggs under them. So they will sit on eggs. Like, they they sat on my goose eggs for 28 days. Um, not 30. Not 31. You guys are going too high now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> 23 is too low. Well, 23 was day, 23 <laughs> days. Yeah, well, oh, chickens two. can go an extra day or two, depending yeah. on the weather and other no, things. They those are wait. those are guesses for the number. No, of, it was. Uh, was that um, the, oh, Matt, chicken hatched twenty-three days. Okay. Days. Yeah, yeah average is so. average is twenty-one. My silkies will hatch chicks in sometimes nineteen day, days. It's crazy. Oh, Jan, you got is that the number of chicks that you're guessing? Twenty-seven chicks is correct. So we have twenty-seven chicks that have hatched in the last two months. Um, most of them are going to be freezer camp birds because we do not need that many birds, but, um, we'll probably choose some of the bigger girls, um, maybe some with more color on them because we're getting a lot of white chicks to keep, uh, and add to the flock. My rooster is white, so that's why we get so many white chicks. So we lost our silky rooster today. That is a whole nother thing. Yeah. Our silky roo. Only had him briefly a few months yeah, we got him early spring from a girl who did 4-h last year with him and he's a beautiful rooster fairly friendly although if you picked him up he was friendly but if you got into his space he tried to attack but kind of silly he never hurt you um so he actually got sick this week and yeah, it was just a few days yeah so 27 chicks sorry he got sick this week. I think he had probably impacted crop and sour crop. I tried massaging it a few times to see if I could get whatever was in there out. Um, I separated him from the flock. I was giving him uh, some water with apple cider vinegar and garlic and a little bit of raw honey. And I even put um, some oregano in there because those are all supposed to be anti... Uh, Going back to the roads discussion that was happening with some of you about... Yeah. Uh, naturopathic and do things work or not work? Uh, yeah. Remedies. Which well, for this. It, we don't know for sure. Yeah. But, but it's a commonly used. Yeah. For this, basically what, you know, I've been doing a lot of reading in the last few days. Um, uh, for this, if he has something stuck in his crop, uh, that would, that would be an impacted crop. So I'm suspecting that because he was awfully thirsty. That's when I first noticed that he was so thirsty. He was, drinking a, ton, yeah. he was drinking a ton. His crop was all squishy. I couldn't feel anything solid in there. Uh, the sour crop is a yeast infection of the crop. So that's why I was giving him the water with all the stuff in it to try to kill the yeast uh, infection. And that can often happen back to back where you have a hen with, or rooster in this case with impacted crop and then you get rid of the blockage but they develop an infection um but he hadn't pooped in the you know in a day and a half that he was in the crate oh, yeah. separated so i don't think anything was still getting through he was drinking a lot he i also mixed some um of his feed in some yogurt so it didn't work. He passed today, unfortunately, and I had to go out and bury him today. So he, yeah, so he, there was probably something in there because nothing was getting through all the way through his GI system. Now, question of impacted crop versus something else blocking that system is a whole other question, but he definitely was, was, uh, yeah, so we need another, we need another silky rooster. Yeah. Unless now, one of these young ones might be a... Boy. We have four young ones right now that are all his uh, offspring. Now, that <laughs> downfall to that is they're all siblings to each other. They might be half-siblings, but they're all siblings to each other. Um, so there's a little bit of potential inbreeding if we keep the rooster, or the question is, do we get another rooster? You were mentioning, you know, talking at the youth fair. This the youth fair is coming up in like two weeks for us. We have a very early 4-H fair, and it's a fairly good size one. So they have a nice poultry barn. We have some friends that actually still show poultry. Yeah. So it's possible that we could find somebody. The kids show the poultry. Yeah, well, the kids sell for the kids. So, yeah. Um, that somebody may be willing to sell off extra 
uh, um, silky rooster. silkies, and we don't need a show winning silky, just a, a decent, just a decent one. So that's probably our best contact to a lot of different poultry raisers, all in one shot. And we'll probably end up there on a, it's a busy week, uh, but yeah, like one day yeah. during the week we'll take a walk around. So, um, yeah, so that might be one option. The other option would be to see if any of these babies are male and uh, maybe keep them. <laughs> our, our statistics on our silkies, whenever we've hatched them, we've had a heck of a lot more boys than girls so far. So it would be awfully funny if they were all girls this time, but they're only two weeks old, so too early this to tell. This is the first time with this. This, real, the, right? this rooster, yes, is the first so. time with this rooster. I had another rooster that ended up being related to um, most, all, most of them. All the he had uh, all his daughters were in there, so I decided to get a new one, but uh, that didn't work out too long. <laughs> so we'll see what happens if they're all. I'm not sure if we'll get one right away because it's not like we're going to go for more silky chicks anytime soon. They have a guardian. They have Gus as their guardian, so they do have a guardian to watch over them. Yeah, we're maxed out on our chicks for the year. Yeah. Uh, most of what was hatched, a few will be egg replacers, but a lot of them are probably going to end up being meat chicks Yeah. Uh, for the late fall to get us into winter. Yeah, and the silky hens are there mainly to be my broody mamas, and so next year we have a few more, because right now I have three silky hens that all three of them have gone broody, some of them multiple times already. So... Uh, so I tend to use them. I don't have any artificial setups for our chicks. That they're always raised by hens. And the silkies are nice because they're less aggressive mamas. Mm -hmm. Like almost all of the chicks coming from being raised by main flock hens end up being meat because I can't touch them. The moms guard them so much I can't get them used to my handling them. So uh, the silky ones I can handle a little bit more. And they'll raise the full-size chicks too. So anyway... That's one thing that happened today. Um, I'm, the chat stopped for a little bit during that story. I did have one other video that I wanted to mention though, and I um, that we got out this week, and that's a review of a garden tool, the Jap Japanese sickle, which is very helpful in chopping and dropping weeds. So you can take a look at that. I did also put a link to the sickle if you're interested in it down below in the description. Um, and it's definitely helpful in weeding and getting it small enough to get between plants and you got to keep that edge sharp, but it's actually working quite nicely. Um, so turning your weeds into mulch, which is nice. Otherwise, I don't know, did the chat not update? I'm not sure. Is, can someone put, try posting to the chat? Because my chat doesn't seem to be updating. I want to make sure it's still working, but... It seems like the feed's working otherwise. Um, and I know there's a delay, so we'll give it a moment while I go on to the next thing. Another thing that we are going to have, videos up and coming, if we could get this done today. We have a bunch of green walnuts that we harvested. Mm -hmm. I harvested half of them. You grabbed a few more that were higher up. And... Oh, there we go. Yeah, it appears to work. Still Good. Right, chat away. <laughs> Thanks. Have fun. Keep chatting. It is an Amazon <laughs> link down below, um, Big Bear. So if you want to check out that sickle? tool for the sickle, oh, okay. yeah, it's um, it's an Amazon link. If you're interested, you can go yeah, separately. There's a couple of other people in our area that well, one of them flies to Japan a lot. He buys really nice. Yeah. Um, well, they're kind of run of the mill, but he brings back kind of ones he likes that are uh, yeah. because it's a very common garden tool um, in Asia. Yep. Uh, but especially Japan. Especially in Japan, and it's it's definitely been very helpful. So if you're interested in that, I definitely have been pretty much taking it out whenever I go to the garden, um, so I could do a little bit of chop and drop whenever I'm out there. Um, so awesome! Thank you guys for all responding. <laughs> <laughs> it was just went like silent for a minute. I was like, well, with the with the storm coming in, I want to make sure we didn't lose something. Yeah, so. but it was still moving in the so video. We're so we're over to the walnuts. <laughs> so walnuts. So what are you gonna do with the walnuts? Uh, we're gonna make nocchio. No, 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 I think yeah. it's an Italian black uh, black walnut liquor, uh, liquor or liqueur. Um, <clears throat> is the roots for it uh, are those black walnuts? Yes. yes. So you actually um, steep or make a tincture with the entire 
walnut when it's in about the size of a golf ball, a little smaller, a little bigger. So when it's still green, basically, when it's green, still green, you can young. cut the whole thing with a knife Easily. into pieces or halves or quarters uh, without having the shell get in the way. And you yeah. steep it in a neutral alcohol, a vodka, a grappa, or whatever, white alcohol, and a light amount of spices, and you leave it there for a month or so. And then you typically add yeah. sugar or simple syrup, sweetening it up, and then you leave it around, <clears throat> leave it alone for six months to a year, and it all mellows out. So all those really bitter, tannicky flavors, which are a little uh, too strong, uh, become really mellow, and it becomes uh, an aperitif or a digestif. Or you can do, you can cut it with uh, soda, and you know it becomes. Uh, um, well, it's going to be dark and and heavy and rich some people say it's like mapley or like cola um yeah. it's like a lot of the dark dark items um but it gets very complex and so frequently people add in spices like cinnamon and cloves yeah citrus vanilla coffee beans sometimes few few items all go in there um so traditional of sort of northern italy italy and into uh, central europe yep and through central europe yeah. for sure so all kinds of versions um, you can buy it. Yes, Big Bear. We are going to do a video on it. In fact, we're going to probably record that after we're done here. Yeah, we're going to do a late video tonight. Um, yeah. The other thing is, it is so it's easy to make and it's very cheap because you can just buy very simple, decently made, <clears throat> you know, white alcohol of some sort. Yeah. Or whatever is produced in your basement, which uh, I will look for up. those in the south who produce in the basement. Um, but yeah, but you can definitely buy it uh, or make it. Uh, the black walnuts are easy to come by. The American ones are a little more tannic, so you may use a few less. Uh, if you can get English walnuts, um, they may be a little bit smoother. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, the aging process takes out all the strong flavors. Um, Nocino, I think. Nocino Italian. Yep. Um, and there's another name in like Czechoslovakian. No, it was Croatian. Or Croatian. And I know. tried to pronounce yeah. it on our, uh, I went out and started making this video on just collecting the walnuts. So I tried to pronounce it in there, but I probably murdered it. And, and thanks for the, the guys at Van Cal Permaculture, yeah. actually I think it was one of the ladies that posted, posted has that. already made some, uh, yeah. it was an original idea. I was uh, familiar with the product. Don't yeah. know if I've ever had it, but I knew of it. Um, I think we even thought about it a few years ago, but it was too... Um, it was too late. I have a yeah. book on Michigan uh, historical recipes, and they actually do pickled walnuts. Yeah. Which is I've... something else we could try and get a few more and pickle them. Yep. Breakaway home. <laughs> Nochino. Yeah. Yep. Um, I've heard some people say Nocino, but I think it's Nochino. No, Nochino. Nochino. It's a hard C in Italian. Yeah, exactly. That, that CH sounding. Yeah. So, yeah, so we're going to do that. We're going to try to put a video together on that. I've started recording for the harvest, but then we'll do the kitchen part, at least the first step, because it's going to take like a month to two months to get let it sit before you do the second step of adding the simple sugar to it. Yeah, and then you really just don't worry about it. for I guess, they, Six months is sort of when it's ready. So it's traditional. Around at, Christmas. Yeah, around Christmas time, because, again, you're thinking heavy yeah. flavors, colder weather. Um, the item... Uh, in Italy is done June 24th, which um, coincides with the Feast of uh, San mm -hmm. Jean Baptiste. Uh, yes, there's recipes for pickled green walnuts. So those are the unripened green walnuts. Yeah. So you could try that so, too. Mind yeah. you that as noted, while it's very traditional to do it in Italy on the 24th, this being linked to, of course, the feast days and the saints and using the calendar for your pastries and your eating yeah. and your garden. Um, your calendar and garden may not be on the same, same garden page. as Florence. Um, <laughs> I saw in the upper Midwest, somebody in, I think it was Minnesota or Wisconsin, says all the way through the middle of July. What you yeah. don't want is much bigger than a golf ball. And if you can't cut yeah. through the shell, Just about um, like it, you know, easily it's too light. The you want to grab one? Yeah, the skin, the, should be, the skin should be pretty thin. Yeah. So you are making limoncello from a recipe you got from... Oh, Al Malfi. Uh, I've been to Amalfi. I spent a bunch of time in Amalfi. Um, the lemons red. are like this big in Amalfi. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so these are perfect. We we're afraid they'd be mature. These are smaller than a golf ball. Yeah. These are like, I don't know, they're like a, a bigger than a shooter. Like a ping pong ball. They're smaller than a ping pong ball. Slightly. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they are actually perfect. 
And with all the wind here, is they're actually dropping out of our trees right now. Yeah, we have bit. one nice tree that and it's bearing heavily this year. Yeah. Uh, last year didn't so much. So we're gonna make that. We'll make a video on it. I have seen pickled walnuts, at, uh, green walnuts like this too. I have a book right here. You have something called walnut pickles and watermelon cake. <laughs> um, that might be a cool one to link. Yeah. This book is very, very, very hard to find. Um, it's two professors okay. from the west side of Michigan that wrote uh, using recipes. There you go. Uh, throughout Michigan, most of them from the 18 and early 1900s. Uh, farmhouse recipes. So Larry Massey and Priscilla Massey. Um, this book is out of print. It's been out of print for a long time. It was a limited run. Uh, I think I paid around a hundred dollars for it and got in very good shape. And I was very lucky to get it at that because it century of Michigan two cooking. or three hundred dollars if you can get it is not uncommon. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and it has basically transcripts of recipes and who they are from. This is from 1990 Wayne State University Press. It's a very small run on it. Um, yeah. I found it through something else, some slow food things I was working on. It has a poem from Kalamazoo starting it, which is where we live. And a lot of these recipes seem to be gathered from the west side of the state where we're living. So I got this in New York right before we moved back. Oh, it's thundering. And it uses housewives and family cookbooks and church cookbooks to gather these very authentic recipes. And most of them have little stories. And they almost always tell who the recipes are attributed to, the city, and the uh, year to try and put some context to it. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots and lots of celery being used. Like you wouldn't believe how many crazy oh places they put celery because that was the new hottest thing. It was like the pomegranate goji berry yeah. mango scene of <laughs> well, the time. Fun fact, Kalamazoo and Portage, which are like north and south of each other, were called both called Celery City um, because the it's debated whether an Irishman or the Dutch were the first ones to bring celery from Europe here. So they were the first celery um, places to grow celery in the United States. Uh, and mainly because there's so much floodplain of the Kalamazoo River right around this area. So there was a lot of celery plantations around here. So it was the hot, new hot thing and it took a while for it to take off. People thought it was poisonous. I'm so, looking for the the recipe and under walnuts I am is it walnuts continued okay cake and ketchup and really <laughs> a lot of things listed in there that I wouldn't yeah think well of. and you gotta so you're thinking about settlers so the farmhouse okay. settlers um a lot of Western European Northern European um. Yeah. It was pretty. A lot it, of Dutch, German, English, Irish, English, um, yeah. Scan, some Scandinavian, yeah. um, and a lot of farm, a lot of Amish. Um, so a lot of that kind of old style yeah. German Amish cooking. Uh, so we saw a lot of small farms and people pickling and preserving and canning what was available. So it's a really really cool book. I wish I was going to pull the recipe. Just Big Bear said it must have been an Irishman because they're all, always starting something. <laughs> <laughs> That's too Always looking for. They stuff. were actually the the thing was the Irishman may have been the first one to bring it to the area and to get it, people to start eating it because he brought it into a high end club where they featured it and then but it didn't really take off. The Dutch came in and started growing it in mass and started selling it at like the railroad station, which our railroad station here is on the line between halfway between Chicago and Detroit. And they had a bunch of vendors at the station selling it at the station. Because people would get off the train to eat, you know, buy yep. things during when they were refueling and watering. Uh, so people would sell food, of course. Um, Dutch farms still are, are known to be some of the better vegetable farms. Yep. Historically, they just, you know, they were really good at growing there's a lot of Dutch vegetables. Right yeah, and just north of us is a very, very heavy Dutch population. There's Holland, Michigan, just north of us. No. So anyway... Um, so the Dutch still are, are doing a lot Wa of growing. Uh, walnut pickles are actually under pickles, not under walnuts. <laughs> of course. Well, why didn't you think of that? Well, that's oh. why I did think of that. I just had to. Are you going to read the recipe to me? I'm going to look at it and just remember. <laughs> I looked at this previously. Yeah. No, someone else was talking about pickled walnut, yeah, walnuts. Yeah, I've seen that. Time. Pickled butternuts or walnuts yeah. um, versus butternut pickles. Um, You're off the screen. So I'm reading. <laughs> okay. I'm going to go on to pokeweed because that's what we actually is 
Yeah. Um, what I was focusing on and we haven't started talking about yet uh, in the description below here on our live show, there is a link to my webpage where I do herb of the week once in a week or forge fruit Friday, or this one's also debatable edible because you can only eat pokeweed in a certain way. And sometimes, and some people will not eat it at all. Um, so pokeweed when it's very small, looks like this. Um, it will, this is actually after the leaves are starting to unfurl and actually might be a little bit on the later side to pick them. Although some people say as long as there's no red in it yet, that it's still edible. So if you take that into account. No, um, we have not tried eating pokeweed as of this time. No, but I've, it's come up we so much. We have some friends that definitely eat it and enjoy it's it. It's come up so much in conversation recently that I decided to go ahead and feature it. We should probably try it at some point, but I think our plants are a little bit past yeah, it's too time hot. to We're harvest because they are now about this size, which is kind of medium size for a pokeweed. Um, still no red in our plants, which is interesting. And the red part is what's supposed to be poisonous. We've had very rapid growth because it was very, very wet and it just got hot in the last week. So we've yeah. had explosive growth. And if you look at it, it has really quite large oblong leaves. Um, it has a, this is the flower bud. Ours aren't in flower yet. So this little yeah, stem, just starting to bud. this stem will get longer and I'll have when these flower buds open up, it'll be kind of a greenish white flower along this long stem. And then the berries will grow along those stems after the flowers are done. And those are a, a purple to black color, um, kind of wider than uh, tall berry and the berries are poisonous, but they have been used as a dye or as ink either one so um, Kind of interesting Th this plant has <clears throat> been used medicinally Mainly in Asia now. This is the American pokeweed. Uh, there is a slightly different species in Asia, but they use it um, medicinally there in the south they tend to use this more in fact, it's also has a bunch of names. Pokeweed is what we call it up here in the north. Poke salad, which is S-A-L-L-E-T, is actually probably one of the original names that people use, but that has turned into poke salad, which you never want to eat this as a raw green, regardless. Um, salad comes from a French word that actually means to cook. So you want to actually cook really young poke greens and if you're going to eat it, you want to have it in a couple changes of water. And there are people who love it. Now, I haven't tried it yet, so this might be something on our list to try for next year. But I think they're too far along. I think Daryl Patton really liked it. Uh, our Mike friend Hogue. Navi and Mike Hogue both enjoy yeah. it, uh, at least early in the season. Mike Hogue is the he guy really I'm taking the it, permaculture so. class from. And he really loves this now. Um, Navi eats this. Um, I believe as well and she eats she's the one I tried the debatable edible on before because she eats bracken fern as well when it's very young and um, Which is another one of those things. We, we like that. I like bracken fern I have no people problem by the it. way keep saying the bracken fern has all these different flavors and different like yeah. trying to describe it Like asparagus or asparagus this. and other things I taste it. It tastes just like nori it's just because I, I think, don't think most people know what nori is. I think that nori, yeah, the um, the seaweed, the dried seaweed wrappers yeah. for sushi, or That's sometimes true. now they're doing the crisp, you know, the crisps for snacks. Um, salt, and I think what it was was we didn't eat much seaweed except for as sushi has become more popular over the last twenty plus years. That that wasn't part of our vocabulary, right? Because you get this umami or savoriness um, from the bracken fern, especially when it's dried. And to me, it's a complete land replacer for seaweed yeah um but yeah so yeah so this is another debatable edible because you have to cook it or else you in two changes of water at least or else you might get sick from it most people if they get sick they get stomach upset or diarrhea but it can get very bad um if eaten too much um the I'm trying to think if there was anything else there. I'm looking at our web page right now, so you can always when you try and get it out of the ground. The root is huge. It's like a parsnip. Yeah. It's just it's monster. Massive. You got to go in there with a spade or a fork and tug on it. It's yeah. even the tiny plants will have a giant root big under root. it. Root. It's amazing. And it grows six to nine feet tall. Some people will even say up to ten feet tall. So it is actually it will get huge. Ours are. Our tallest ones right now are probably about five feet tall. Yeah, I just knocked one over in the garden. We pulled out a yeah. bunch in the garden. The rest we just can't leave them. Uh, I 
knocked one over today. It was about yeah. three feet tall. Yeah, but I mean, along our forest edge. And Actually, I think the knocked the one over that's in the picture. You probably did. Uh, so uh, they're growing, they do grow along forest edge in disturbed soil, along yeah. fences, along the roads. They like water. They wet, do like wettish. the little wettish, yeah. foresty areas. Yeah, they like the moist. Uh, so, yeah, they do have a big root, and some people use root medicinally, and especially in Asia, uh, which this is one thing that I have not seen any many studies on as far as medicinal uses, um, although traditionally it's been used in a number of ways. And that is one thing we try to do is when I look sure. up something that has, you know, traditionally medicinal uses, um, I'm trying to see if anybody is starting to look into the research on it because I am in genetics and I like to try to figure out if you know people have um, developed any studies to look into some of these uh, uses. Um, and not how necessarily genetic though. No, not necessarily genetic. <coughs> Just no. biochemical or Medi medicinal. medicinal. Yeah. So part of the plant you want to harvest is the really, really young shoots before you start seeing any red. So you use them basically like spinach or sauteed greens. To yeah. But you do want actually or a lot of time to boil soup, them. Soups. Yeah. You, so you've already blanched them a couple of times. Yes, you want to so blanch you either them squeeze first. them out and then you saute them with onion products or you soup. fortify soups and stews. Yeah. So um some of the traditional medicinal uses by the <clears> way <throat> some with the root some have used it as an anti-tumor rem remedy or antiviral and a immune stimulant it's something you got to be really careful about because like i said it the toxins are at highest concentration actually in the root in the mature leaves and in the berries so you got to be really careful it's only a really small um yeah, I'd stay away from it. Yeah, I probably would. <laughs> I, it's not something I'd be comfortable using, personally. Uh, they've used it as uh, tincture, as topically as for treatment for mastitis as well. But still, it does get a, some of these toxins do absorb through the skin, so you do have to be really careful there. Um, the only research I saw that was looking into it was looking into some of the anti-tumor properties, and this was really pretty preliminary research looking in the petri dish at some cancer cells and trying to see if extracts from the Asian variety in China and the American variety, if they had any anti-tumor properties. And they both did, but the Asian <clears throat> variety had more um, anti-tumor properties. So I didn't see anything else uh, that looked into the claims on mastitis uh, or anything and the I did see some things on the antiviral activity, but only on plant viruses. So mm -hmm. that was kind of interesting because apparently it's poke is very resistant to plant viruses. So there's a lot of research on why that is and what's going on there. But I didn't see anything in relation to treatment of viruses in animals. So do you want to watch it um, because the toxic components I would be very hesitant to use it medicinally personally um but as far as cooking the really long, young leaves i would probably not have a problem with that i'd try it next year i think um to see what it tastes like myself so i guess question out to you guys is have you guys do you guys eat poke poke salad poke uh weed <clears throat> whatever you guys call it in your area um i eat barbecue barbecued poke you eat barbecue pork yes pork <laughs> oh, they do sometimes spell it instead of P-O-K-E, they sometimes spell it P-O-L-K. But again, it's mm -hmm. probably just a variation on the pronunciation of it. So um, just kind of glancing back at some big, of... Big Bear headed out. Yeah. Um, Breakaway said they were planting spinach this week. Malabar, Malabar spinach. Malabar spinach, which is your summer, summer heat, more heat tolerant. Um Yeah. And it is commonly swapped for spinach because it's the only darn thing that grows in the summer. Uh, and it, it's in some ways it's almost nicer. The yeah. really early spring winter hoop house spinach is amazing. We still have a ton of uh, wild spinach, lamb's quarter in our garden. Yeah, it's starting to mature. It is starting uh, to. Be I a actually bit. almost was going to put some in the pasta tonight. We were given some bullets uh, yesterday that were just on the turn, um, yeah. and so we had local foraged uh, bullets. I was going to put some spinach or lamb's quarters in there but then i have a ton of peas so um put peas in instead 
And Breakaway is also doing a Hoogle Culture raised bed planter. We have one Hoogle Culture bed that we're playing with. Our garlic is going nuts. And so is our the potatoes. potatoes. Are replanted, yep. The potatoes, I thought I got all the potatoes out of there last year, but apparently not because we have a heck of a lot of plants growing parents in our yeah i think in the, i didn't know it was there. i think poke is more popular as an edible in the south yes i don't know is. why it grows just fine here it just seems like it took on a <laughs> regular diet more often i think south. it just ended yeah it just ended up working its way into the southern food um culture so uh it does grow I mean, arkansas is only partially south but it's mid south right mid south that's what we <laughs> call it when i lived in memphis so i called it mid south yeah um <laughs> and helix just joined me behind me hi you want to say hi helix um he likes to join our live shows he just likes laughs in the evening time but yeah so it is it, it doesn't grow everywhere so breakaway homesteader where are you because from what i can tell it grows most prevalently and actually there's two slightly no. different varieties that grow no. prevalently in the south um southeast especially and then all the way up the east coast um the only states when i looked at the fda maps the only states i think where i didn't see it growing were in some of the rocky mountain states kind of in the northwest um uh, so seems you like the sandy disturbed soil a lot we get it growing very yeah but i think it also enjoys some of the clay soil so i think it grows everywhere yeah. but it's got tough maybe not in the higher them. elevations yeah uh, so that might be part of it in the mountains. So yeah, you'll see the bear as it gets big, and you see the dark berries in the mid to late summer. It's pretty obvious because yeah. they're pretty good size. Yeah, it's easiest to identify in the summer when you do see those dark berries. Now I don't have any pictures of it because ours are just barely starting Another to bud. Another month we'll have berries, and yeah. then a little after that maybe eh, we might have some if it stays hot and may ripen up by end of July. Yeah, so I might have to do some updates to some of these plants as we go through a season to kind of show what they look like later in the season. Um, I might just do a, maybe we'll do that towards the end of the summer. I'll do some updates of these ones that we've had early pictures of. So we did that with mullen, with the pokeweed. It's still, you know, halfway grown, most of the way grown, but it's still not in that last stage. So we might have to do an update uh, blog and video on it. Um, another person, by the way, who, if you like foraging and learning about foraging stuff, another person who's doing a lot of foraging videos now once a week, um, is Rose over at Wholesome Roots. In fact, uh, we both, she does a video every Friday that is a forage food Friday, or I forget what she calls it. That's what I call my, my blog on it that I release every Friday now. Um, but she's doing a, like a Friday foraging video as well, where she focuses on one thing a week. And this week, I think hers was elderberry. Now, we don't have elderberry. We just on our got flowers about two weeks ago. We don't have elderberry on our property. We just planted. And I should change that. Flowering just happened in our area about two weeks ago or so. I just planted two elderberry plants, but they're tiny and they're not anywhere near uh, flowering at this point. So eventually we'll have elderberry, hopefully, if they survive. But we don't have any naturally growing here. Um, so. Raspberries should be coming. I saw the first raspberries in the market this week. Yeah. I think we'll have raspberries Probably showing up on our property. This Probably this week or next week. All this yeah. we're on the high eighties all week, so they should be ripening uh, stuff up. Stuff is stuff is maturing quickly. Yeah, we might have to keep For our being five or six weeks behind in the start of the season, we are rapidly catching up and on track. Well, we've had a lot of days in the nineties. A lot of rain, a lot of heat. So Yeah. So it feels like the south here right now. We keep going back and forth a little bit, but oh, too many days in the 90s. I don't like 90s. There's a reason why I live in the north. Um, elderberry plants in North Carolina producing stop the fruit, flowers. Yeah, 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 producing fruit. Yeah, um, ours are in flower in this region right now. Um, and with the heat, they will not flower for long. No, they'll probably go. Last year, we were able to keep flowers for two or three weeks because you can get them deeper into the shade. Yeah. But I don't know how much flowers are going to be around this year. Yep, and we don't, and again, we don't have them on our property, so it's hard to tell uh, here. But uh, if you like the foraging things, please check out Rose as well as mine. Um, I'd like to do a collaboration with Rose because we have different formats of doing it. Maybe we can figure out what, because she's down in Georgia. The other challenge there is what does she have and what do we have at the same time being in very different growing climates. 
but there are some overlap things. In fact, we did our plantain talk the week before Rose was going to do hers, and I think she changed it up because we just did ours. But if we did it the same week, we could probably collaborate on it. But I don't know. We'll have to see. Um, yeah, elderberry jams and jellies and such. Elderberry wine. Egg roll. Um, other like common things. items. Yeah. Yeah, there's lots of stuff with elderberries that you can do. The syrup and... Um, syrup is very common, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people use that for the antiviral. And that, I have seen studies on the antiviral of elderberry. elderberry. It's definitely got a lot of that. In fact, um, compare that to no no treatment. Now, you always have to keep that in mind. But for the, um, for the flu, in the flu season... Average flu tends to last people about six or seven days, and the average flu when someone's taking elderberry syrup is actually two days shorter hmm. than, so there's definitely some there, and it's less severe um, reports on that too, so it's kind of interesting. So elderberry is good to have around, um, but that's not our, <laughs> that's not our uh, weekly forage item because we don't have it on, on site here. But did we'll you, chat did about you get pictures of the oysters and bull eats, or that was too late? Because that was at no, that was, I, it was too late. Yeah, um, maybe next week we can show you pictures of so our dinner. So we <laughs> we had crazy rain uh, over the last couple of weeks. Just sort of finished up last week, so we had an abundance of mushrooms. Now we didn't get a chance to go out mushroom foraging. We've been busy this week, um, but I was just gifted some, um, quite a few, uh, some bull eats and some. Uh, and a whole bunch of oysters. I guess there's just oysters abounding all over the trees, um, more than you can ever use. So uh, I was given some really nice stuff, and we happened to cook with um, all the bullets, which I don't think I've ever had wild, similar to a porcini, but an American version. Yeah. And or wild oysters I have definitely had, but yeah. they're a treat. So yeah. the two together was very nice. And I am trying to run like three programs at once here so I can upload it into OBS, see if we could get it by the end of the show. But I don't have pictures of the mushrooms themselves. I have pictures you know, of the I don't dinner. think I took any pictures of the mushrooms before yeah. I cut them. But you made a very, I think I could, the way you explained it to me, I think I could cook this dinner. It's pretty simple. Um, put in ingredients. Yeah. Peas, the two types of mushrooms. I did put in like two garlic scapes. Uh, salt, pepper, these chopped up garlic scapes. Yeah, chopped them up really small. Um, ground fresh black pepper, white pepper, some sea salt, but you could use any old salt and pepper. Um, had a, eight ounces of cream, which I just reduced down after the mushrooms were seared and cooked. Oh, I threw the peas in. Had shelling peas from the garden, and then we had some fresh um, uh, casareche pasta, which I made. I'm seeing if I can run this program and pull this image up that I just basically didn't even edit but saved. I wonder if it'll work while I'm running this program. This will be a first and very quick. Oh, I think it worked. This is crazy. I've never tried to upload a picture onto this. Uh, it's OBS well, software. Your new computer's got a lot of, a lot of memory and a lot of yeah, processing speed. It should be able to handle it. Okay. Your, your old one couldn't. Would you like to see a picture of our uh, dinner tonight, which was very easy to make that he just basically gave you the recipe for? You put cream in there. I did. I used, well, this made about four or five portions. Yeah. I used eight ounces of cream reduced down, and so it just coats the pasta. Uh, we're not big on, I, I like cream, but not tremendous amounts of cream bathed pasta just enough to bring all the mushroom flavors together. Yeah, that was really good. So that was our dinner here um tonight with the bolites and the oysters and mike's pasta from our pasta business that's the um casareche casareche and it's a twisted pasta yeah it's it's fun so i should probably scooch over so you can scooch over i keep um so anyway yeah the bolites were really nice now bolites in michigan um there's like eight or more variety, common yeah. varieties that are edible, and there's some that are not. We're not really an expert on them. No. Uh, these were given to us by a certified mushroom forager. So, Nobby. Yes. So I was. Uh, <laughs> um, if you watch our, our foraging videos. <laughs> I know that if you, you know, so the bullets, some of them change colors, and if they change to the green, blue versus the, you know, versus the brown, they tend to be bitter or not good. Yeah. Most of the bullets will not kill you, but can make you 
mildly not feel well or can give you a couple days of feeling really not well. They um, probably won't kill you, from, but yeah, you will not yeah, feel well. Yeah, and there are some else. people that are more sensitive than others, yeah. uh, but that also depends between the varieties. And I think there was multiple varieties. A couple of them that were in there were very sort of fruity and herbaceous. I mean, had a different characteristic to them. And they kind of, ours were mostly red capped because they can change from yellow to red to brown. Um, so I think there was, again, a couple of different varieties in there. Yeah. But um, very, very nice flavors, similar to a very mild porcini, not, not as pungent as a European porcini. Um, I was actually, you guys are still chatting about um, elderberries. So I was actually yeah. going to try to link an article that came up on elderberries uh, in our local permacul permaculture group. So let me see if I can find that for you guys because it does go through identification. Oh, yeah, that was nice. Um, uh, it has some chestnuts and elderberries here. Yeah, but I'll, no, that's his pictures. I, there was actually a link to maybe it was in the discussion. Um, Probably. Three replies. Yes, there we go. I'm going to put this in the, watch your knee. I'm going to put this in the um, description here. So I took elderberry flowers last year. I had made a strawberry rhubarb tart um, and then made it in a nice little sweet tart shell yeah. uh, for the restaurant I was working at and um, had some elderberry flowers given to me. So I garnished with powdered sugar and some elderberry, uh, elderberry blossoms at that yes. point. Uh, very delicate young ones and put them on there and I found a, 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 a Facebook post popped up from a year ago uh, with it last week <laughs> and I remember how nice it was and they tasted amazing and I also remember how none of them sold. Because um, people don't know what they, they are They didn't know here. how, I mean strawberry rhubarb tart, I, I thought I would have sold every one of them in the first two hours uh, on Friday night. Come the end of the weekend and they're starting to get soggy, I had to give them away. Yeah. To, to staff because they weren't sellable uh, and they were so nice local yeah. rhubarb local strawberries a fresh made you know a pate uh, sucre uh, you know, sweet tart shell and then the powdered sugar and the elderberry made a really nice picture um, but anyways we enjoyed them because yep. that was it and terry was talking about going to start doing blueberries in containers next year got eight pounds of from the that. neighbors um in fact that's probably not a bad idea because blueberry soil is very particular. Um, they like acidic soils and sometimes they like soils that other plants don't always like. So doing them in containers is not a bad idea, although I think they do need the nutrients. So you do have I to I think that, sure yeah, they prefer more nutrients. We do, there's a lot of commercial blueberries here and they do fertilize most of them. Yeah. Um, so the pH and the soil conditions and the rotting materials are all important, but uh, they do like to be fed. Yeah, so this link that I posted. Yeah, strawberry here. rhubarb tart, homemade tart, not popular. Yeah, I don't know what was going on with whoever was dining that night, but uh, they they were the ones that were missing out. It wasn't. It, How it, is strawberry rhubarb not? There just, are a few people that are allergic to rhubarb or just dislike it. I, I understand that, but some people don't like sour. Okay. Well, you put so much sugar in, it's not really sour. I know that's true. I like it sour. Yeah, though. pine needles <laughs> work great as one way to acidify. Yeah. Um, yeah. Bog soils, and that's why cranberries and some blueberries, uh, the peat, peat tends to be acidic naturally if you add in some peat moss. Yeah. The By the way, going back up to that link I posted up there, that is a lot of information on elderberries. Um, I actually shared it when I heard that Rose was going to do her uh, Forage Food Friday on elderberries. Um, I sent that link over to Wholesome Roots on Facebook, so you guys can take a look at that if you're interested, because it does go over a lot of what you can do with it. I think it has some recipes in there, and it has um, identification information and all of that, so it's a fun link. Um, Our neighbor has some blueberry bushes. They're cultivated blueberry bushes. That they're just along their deck, uh, their patio, which has a concrete slab, yeah. um, so it actually pulls nice heat, and they get tons of them off of there. Although oh, yeah. they did. They did accidentally get trimmed between um, neighbors before I think somebody came in and did some trimming and didn't um, didn't know what plant. Yeah, was. so a lot of the new growth they're waiting for some new growth to come out, but we we're just looking at them. Yeah, they were looking um, for good, but yeah, they're doing them in containers. So our blueberries that came with the house, not really in a great area. They're not doing well. Um, we need to replant new blueberries, place somewhere else. Yeah. 
Uh, we planted two rhubarb plants this year, which we just hadn't had. Uh, again, we know they take a few years to get established, but once they go, if they have some nutrients and some water, um, they do amazing around here. Uh, two plants will provide all the rhubarb we could ever use. Yeah. So as long as they take off, I think they're they're hanging in there right now. It's been really hot for them this year, though. Um, yeah, and, well, and rhubarb really finishes out after the early spring. It's not a harvestable. Yeah. So I think we should probably wrap up unless there's questions about anything on um, this week's agenda or questions about anything else. Um, yeah, yep. I use lots of pine mulch on the blueberries. I saw that. So And you can get some oh. of the nice acidifying, some of the organic acidifiers. Um, it's up work nicely, too, if you need to acidify soil. Yeah. Yeah, that was a nice link. That was linked to our local uh, permission permaculture Facebook group here uh, someone put that on there so I'll pass pay it forward pass it on to you guys because it's a great all around everything about elderberry uh, link which so is kind of we cool. will be here next week I know a lot of people are kind of in between a week of vacationing or yeah. pretending to work or whatever you guys call it um, I'm pretty <laughs> busy I got a lot of stuff going on with um, my business yeah and we've got uh, some stuff in the garden um, that we need to do. We've got, I may make some cherry jam this week if I can squeeze that in. But um, yeah, we're kind of running through the work week and then Wednesday, Wednesday di diverting off. a little bit uh, to do some other yeah. stuff. I have Wednesday off, but I work all week otherwise. But pretty, um, pretty normal week. I have markets yeah. on Thursday. Don't know Saturday. what, yeah, market on Thursday and Saturday. I don't know what my Thursday market's going to look like. It's just a midweek market, but yeah. could be really busy with people looking for things to do. Or it could be deserted because people are busy. That's true. But, um, yeah, but we will be back next week on Sunday. And I think what we'll do for next week is I'll look up a bunch of the medicinal uses for yarrow. Uh, it's in bloom around here right now. I picked a bunch of it to dry just today. So I have it hanging to dry. Uh, I'm not doing <laughs> no elderberry. Uh, I don't have elderberry on property. Yeah, elderberry. we don't have any. Uh, we could... We can purchase it in the farmer's market. I have two little plants that are about two feet tall that I just planted. That's about it. Uh, but, yeah. Um, I'm trying to see if I missed anything else here. I think there's some discussions between other people here. Yeah. Uh, blueberry information. Yeah. Blueberry stuff. That's yeah. awesome. Blueberry lemonade. Lots and lots of varieties of blueberries out there, cultivated and semi-cultivated. Yeah big little bush berries uh, michigan the commercial ones tend to grow these high bushes yeah. that are monstrous but our wild ones are low bush yeah our wild ones are low bush it's yeah. just for cultivating commercial cultivating and sorting yeah um the the high bush is easier useful and they get very large i don't yeah. think that's necessarily the best uh use but you can decide if you want a little berry or a big berry and some of them come at different times through the year so yeah. So, yes, have a safe week, everybody. Have a happy 4th of July. For those of you guys with animals on the 4th, I hope it's not too crazy with all the fireworks. For Yeah, I've heard of people that have to sedate their horses and do all kinds dogs of... Dogs. Well, dogs are bad, but horses are... If your horse is out of control, you're really in trouble. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, you're... <laughs> We love our berries here too. We're in the, yeah. we're definitely in a well, berry. Well, we Cindy worked in New Jersey for a while. Yeah. We used to get the wild low bush berries in the state park. Yeah, yeah, uh, they yeah. were just overload. You had to watch you need out. To go. Had to watch out for the bears though because New we Jersey went over to so Harriman State Park. That wasn't over in New Jersey. That's up in the oh, that's north. True. That's, that's on Rockland. the edge. That's just on the edge. That's Rockland County. We would go over um, up into Rockland County at Harriman State Park and go wild in blueberry the floor, yeah. foraging. And on you would the just trails. eat them. As, you know, you're not. I don't know if you're supposed to take them out or not. We never really did we just harvest ate them, there. them. We just ate them because they were just um, acres and acres of them. And you see all these people sitting on the hillside, just sitting there, snacking on blueberries along these trails. It was just kind of funny. But yeah. anyway, blueberries are awesome. We love them. So have a great, safe week, everybody. Hope everybody has a happy Independence Day and enjoys... Um, Enjoy the 4th, and if you have fireworks locally, I hope you enjoy those, and they're not too scary for your animals. Uh, you guys take care. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night.